This morning, we want to look at the Reformation in prophecy. The Reformation in prophecy. Let's read Hosea chapter 6. It's a little book, maybe you can't find it. It's one of my favorite in the Old Testament. One of my favorites, and you'll find it. Um, You'll go to Ezekiel, and then you'll go to Daniel, and then you'll go Hosea, okay, to help you find it. First one says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his goings forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as a latter and former rain unto the earth. Keep your Bible open, please, and we'll be referring to this. Let's pray. Father, we ask you now that you would settle us in your presence, that you'll settle every heart. And we pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts, even if we have never realized these things before. Father, that you would take what is yours and what is precious. And Lord, that you would excite our hearts through your own sovereign will and spirit. And that you would glorify the name of the Lord Jesus, thine only begotten Son, whom you sent into this world to redeem us with his most precious blood. We adore you and we worship you. We thank you, Lord, for being in our midst this morning. And we ask you now that you would continue to speak. Touch these clay lips. And I pray, Lord, that you would quicken my heart and strengthen me in all of my weaknesses to be able to speak the oracles of God. May it be, and thus thus saith the Lord to the church at this time, yea, even to all that will hear it, and even to our own nation. We ask it for Jesus' name's sake. We ask it for his glory. Amen. The Reformation in prophecy. The reason I have picked this is because the 31st of October, 1517, Martin Luther went to the Wittenberg Cathedral in Germany, nailed 95 theses of teachings of the doctrines against Rome, that he would nail them there and that there may be a reformation of the church. Of course, that didn't happen. And notice we're called the Protestant Reformation. The people who came out of the Reformation did not label themselves Protestants. They were labeled Protestants because of their protestations. Now, there's something I want to make clear. I want to get it over very forthrightly this morning. When I say Protestant, I do not mean Protestant is a man and a woman who are out there, who are unsaved, who reject Christ, who claim to be of a Protestant birth, lineal descent. I want to make it clear they are as lost, they are as lost as a Roman Catholic will be in their own denominational trusting. I want to make that clear. I am not speaking about Protestants as if because you come from one side of a religion, whether it's one side of the fence here in Northern Ireland, or Ireland, or Great Britain, or anywhere else in the world, or another religion, then you are automatically bound for heaven. That is not true. That is not right. Your religion will not save you. You being a Protestant by birth, as it were, nominally, on a church Protestant denominational role, will not save you. I want to make it very clear now. It does not mean you're going to be going to heaven does not mean you're in God's kingdom. The Bible exclusively tells us that every man and woman, no matter who we are, must be born again. You must, Jesus said, be born again. So please let me also say at the outset of this, this is never, and not only this morning, but any morning, noon, night, or study that I may bring, is never to bring hatred nor hurt to any individual Roman Catholic person. Make that sure. Make that clear in your heart. We love their soul like a Protestant soul because there is no Catholic soul and Protestant souls. Their souls 
They need Christ. They need saved. They need blood washed. And those who are trusting in whatever denomination, no matter what it is, they will find they are lost without God and without Christ and without hope in the world. So please let me put that out there and make it plain and straight. When I speak of the Reformation, i.e., the Protestant Reformation, they were called that simply because they protested. They protested. It is made known in the Scriptures that this Reformation would come. Do you know the men that we will speak about this week, and we're going to do it next week? The reason why I'm doing it is not only because on the 31st of October was known as the Reformation Day, or the Sunday that would come before that, which is today, which is today. But the reason I'm doing this is because at this time of the year, the devil has his week. The devil has his day. It's called Halloween. It's called uh, the, the worshiping of other spirits and saints when you dress your children up like little vampires and devils and witches and make it known that when you do that with your children, you are okaying. You are okaying the occult in your home. Now, do you hear me? You're okaying the occult in your home. Even if it's a simple thing, you are saying it's Halloween's okay. Halloween is not Halloween. It's Halloween. And so because of the rise in secularism, because of the rise of satanic cult, even Anton LaVey of the church, the founder of the church of Satan, rejoices because so many so-called Christians allow their children to worship Satan at least one day a year. That's his words and not mine. So make that clear, brothers and sisters, when you're dressing your children up like witches and vampires. You are partaking, you are okaying the occult. You are saying that this is okay one day a year. Why? I am bringing this today and again part two and next Sunday morning is because of that time of year this week especially will be all of those times of Halloween, okay? And also to Mark, whenever God raises up one of the, it was actually the biggest move of the Holy Spirit since the day of Pentecost at that point in time. He raised up the reformers and he raised up the truth of God's word. It was the biggest move of the Holy Spirit. Do you know also these reformers whom I hold in dear regard, they all swore, didn't get it all one go. Martin Luther still kept transubstantiation in the mass. Did you know that? But yet he preached the just shall live by faith. So the church would be evolving, finding the truth of the scriptures as the Lord would reveal to them and show them as they searched them. But nevertheless, did you know that not only Martin Luther, and we're going to look before Martin Luther, like John Wycliffe, John Wycliffe, he actually himself and Martin Luther didn't want to leave the Roman church. They were cast out. And the reason they didn't want to leave it, they wanted to reform it. They wanted it to get better. They wanted to remove the faults. They wanted to take away the indulgences. They wanted to take away the transubstantiation of the wafer host God, the abomination in God's sight. They wanted to take it all out of the road. And they wanted a church unified that would glorify Christ through the scriptures. They didn't want a one man to rule over the church as the head, but Christ alone to be the head of the church. That's what they wanted. Reform means to make better by the removal of faults. To make better by the removal of faults, and they wanted to make the Roman Catholic Church better by the removal of faults, which had occurred through Babylonianism, which had come in to the church. The rituals and even the sunbursts around the paintings they had come from Nimrod, the sun god. God foresaw this, especially in the time of Hosea. I want to make all that very clear, that this is not against any single one of them. Or, let me tell you something, we have saved Roman Catholics in our church. Did you know that? In our assembly. Praise God. And I'll tell you something else. We have saved nominal Protestants in our church too. They needed saved. I was one. I needed saved. I was a good old Presbyterian. Well, on the roll. I was on the roll in the church. You could see our family's name. But was I saved? The answer is no. So please make that clear when I bring this for these next two weeks in case anyone or wants to say that we are, or I am, a bigoted against them. Never, never, never. The system is corrupt. It is vile. It's a, a cage of hateful and unclean birds, the scriptures call it. 
and all those who join with it in ecumenism, whether it's Pentecostalism, or whether it's a charismatic movement, or whether it's Presbyterianism, or Baptist, whoever else, they are the harlot's daughters. And it is the harlot. The harlot has now drawn the daughters back in again to the cage. So we must stay apart. We must stay aloof as blood-washed, blood-bought, born-again Christians. And I would like, also likewise say, if someone goes to a Protestant denominational church and they do not preach the gospel, and they don't preach the blood of the Lamb, and they don't preach salvation by grace through faith, and they don't lift up and magnify the Lord Jesus Christ, and they don't worship Him alone, if they don't do these things, I would say leave. If you're a Christian, or else tell them it's time they preach the gospel, in spite of what other men may say. So let me put that out there and make that clear. No religion, no denomination, not Elam movement coming to Elam either, will save any man or woman. Let's look at the scriptures here. Come now, come, and sorry, pardon me, come and let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn, he will heal us, he hath smitten, he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Do you know, brothers and sisters, there are actual, actually men and women also in groups and sects and cults who believe that if you're a Rastafarian or if you're skin colored black or if you're white, you're automatically going to heaven. Do you know that? They think that it qualifies you to go into God's kingdom. I also want to refute that while we're here. That won't save you either. Doesn't matter what tone of skin color you have doesn't matter what uh, Rastafarian movement or whatever you claim to be, it must be by grace through faith. The Reformation is more than just something that happened historically, but it is completely a move of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, let's look at this. Whenever Hosea is saying this, he's saying this in the Old Testament, and he's saying this um, 600, 700 years before Christ, B.C. And deep within Scripture, the Reformation here is hidden. And it's strange here how in the Old Testament, God has spoken of it, yet when we get to the book of Revelation, we find God speaks of it again because it would be closer at hand from John's day. Notice, the Reformation would take place and subsequent rev revivals would come from it through the preaching of God's Word, through the teaching of God's Word, through the printing of God's Word, the publishing of God's Word, and the propagating of God's Word, showing the identity of God's people, showing the identity of God's Son, the Lord Jesus, as the Redeemer of Israel and the Savior of the world. And this was given to Hosea by divine inspiration. And it was given to John in the book of Revelation through divine revelation. Brothers and sisters, next week we'll look at Revelation. The book of Revelation speaks of it as well. But we want to stay with Hosea just for this morning. Verse 1 of our reading, come, let us return to the Lord. Isn't that strange that that's what the Spirit said this morning? If you could hear what, the, what Marianne had given through that, the Spirit spoke and said, come and return. So we're in the Spirit this morning. Come, let us return to the Lord, for notice, he hath torn, he will heal us, he hath smitten, he will bind us up. Point one, I want you to write this down. We're going to do it in three blocks. The last one we'll have to maybe just do short, and we'll look at more next week. Point one, we have the Father smiting the Father smiting. It says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he, that is God, our Father, hath torn, and he, God, our Father, will heal us. He, that is God, our Father, hath smitten, and he, God, will bind us up. Here's another strange thing, and that word encouraged me this morning. That's why I went and stood to listen, because I was, looking to, I was listening to hear because the, uh, the Spirit, the Word through the Spirit also said this morning of the smiting of Christ. And in this, you'll not only see a national point of view, 
you'll also see a personal point of view, and you'll also see a picture of Christ the whole way through it. If Christ isn't in it, then we don't read it. It's as simple as that. If it doesn't lift him up, magnify him, glorify him, exalt him, if it doesn't manifest him, then we don't want to know it because Christ is central to the ministry that I have anyhow and to the ministry of this house. Christ was smitten that you and I could be healed. Notice that. Christ was smitten. We're going to see this. Christ was smitten. God himself had to do the healing because God himself had done the smiting, the Father smiting. So notice that. When torn by God, only God can heal. When smitten by God, only God can bind up. Only a sovereign, determined, decisive, deliberate, sovereign move and act of God is able to bring a man and a woman back to himself. For example, If you turn with me to the book of Isaiah, please, the the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was a contemporary prophet of Hosea. Isaiah preached and he denounced Samaria and Judah, or Jerusalem rather, the two capital cities. I'll tell you more about it. But he denounced both houses of Israel, the northern house of Israel and the southern house of Judah when they had separated And so contemporary means parts of his ministry and parts of Hosea's ministry were working along together. For another example, Micah the prophet was a prophet who was contemporary with him also. And also we have Amos who was slightly before Hosea and he was also around this time too. Do you notice how God, we tend to think there's one prophet in the whole of the land or the whole of the earth. God had different teachers, but God had different leaders, but God had various prophets at various times. He left not himself without a witness that they would bring the word of God. And we had Amos, and we had Hosea, who preached to the northern kingdom of Israel. I've always told you, remember Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, for example, and how they differ, and how yet there's a a border, even an invisible border, as it were, between them. And try and remember that the northern kingdom would be like northern Ireland and the southern kingdom like the the house of Judah, okay? And there's Dublin and Belfast. You had Samaria where Belfast would be and you had uh, uh, Jerusalem where Dublin would be if you want. That's to give you a picture in your mind. And so what happened was Hosea and Amos would prophesy. Elijah would be there at another time and Elisha was there. But they were prophesying to the northern kingdom when you're reading the scriptures. Isaiah comes and prophesies of the fall of the capital city of Samaria and the capital city of Judah. And he was around at that time. Their ministries would overlap. But notice how God would raise men up here and there all over the place. Now, here's the thing to note. God done it again in the Reformation. He raised men up from Europe. He raised men up across Europe. He raised them up in Britain to preach his word and to bring the nation back to God. And that's what these prophets were doing. And he's still able to raise men and up, women up in Ulster. He's still able at this dark time we're moving into to raise men up in Britain. He's still able to raise us up that we will turn again to the word of God. Now I notice this. Isaiah 61 says these words. In verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he hath sent me to notice bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. God was raising men up to do his work, to preach his word, to prophesy unto ancient Israel and now unto uh, the Protestant Reformation and then into uh, Britain, America, and so on today. He raises them up, why? To glorify his name. See, when you're turning on the, 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 the funny channels, I call them the, the, the comedy channels, that's the Christian, most of the Christian channels you're looking at today. And you see some of the, 
the stuff that's going on in the hogwash of those men who are the superstars, little pontificate pope sitting in their mega churches taking all your money. Turn it back off again and don't listen to them. Charlatans of the gospel reaping reward for themselves rather than lifting up the Son of God and glorifying Christ alone. Now, glorifying Christ alone. Now, I notice this. The Lord says that he's the one who's come to heal. This is in Isaiah. This is Old Testament. Then when we go, well, you can turn to it if you want, but I'm not going to read it. You can write it down. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 21. The Lord Jesus, years later, has been born at Bethlehem. He's now baptized at 30 years of age. And now his ministry is starting. He goes into a synagogue and he takes the scroll of Isaiah and he reads this scripture that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him as a man, and he was the Son of God, that the Spirit of God was upon him, and God had sent him to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up wounds, to set the captives free, and all of those wonderful things, because why? Only God could do the healing when he had done the smiting. Only God could do the healing when he had done the smiting. And how can God do the healing save through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Only way he could heal us is at the cross of Calvary when he would come and pay our debt. As I said, Isaiah was a contemporary prophet to the house of Judah mostly, but also to both houses. Judah, or, or the house of Israel, were carried away for their sin into Assyria. They went up north, sort of slightly east north, then traveling through the Caucasus Mountains, over there by the Dariel Pass, or what's known now as the Israel Pass because of their passings over, through into Europe, Europe into Germany, where's now Saxony, and then across Europe. We even read of Paul wanting to go early days to Spain, and into Italy he went, and he, of course, some went to Greece. Well, now go among the dispersed among the Greeks, the Jews said. So they started to disperse coming west, and of course, populating and entering into Scandinavia and up around and towards Britain. Now notice this. This is a key that people miss. Do you see my keys in my pocket? See, I have two keys. They're the same color. They're the same shape. They're the same make. And every time I go to my house, I have a 50-50 chance of which one I'm getting first. I keep meaning the market, but I just keep forgetting. And see, every time I put the wrong key in, it goes in, but it won't turn the lock. It looks the part, and it won't turn the lock. But see, when I take it out and put the right key in, it turns right away. And some people have a, 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 a look-alike key. And they keep trying to turn the lock of Bible prophecy and they miss the whole lot of it because they have missed this key. Two houses with two destinies. Distinction of them. And if you miss it, you're going to miss this prophecy. Let's, as it were, come out from looking down among us. As it were, when you're in a, in a storm and a troubled situation, and someone outside looking in can help you. So we need to come outside looking in to see that God's word of prophecy is not just for the individual or for the assembly or the church in general, but God's prophetic word was for the nations, and it was also for the whole world. Now, we need to look at that. Let's have a, a God's eye view. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you a greater view of this. The house of Israel went captive and the Assyrians came, took them away over a period of years. And as they went captive in the Assyria, and then they were dispersed, it's called the diaspora. And as they were dispersed, now listen to this. The house of Judah, the southern kingdom around their borders, they had 46 fenced cities or 46 fortified cities, okay? And it said that they were all, the Bible tells us the 46, Six uh, fence cities or four to five cities were taken away captive with the northern kingdom. You say, what's all this got to do with the Reformation? It's got everything to do with it. Now listen, stay with me on this. This is important. So there was a 200,000, they reckon, of Judah taken away with the northern house. Years later, as the prophets prophesied, the house of Judah were taken away into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, and we read Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and, Abednego and, and Daniel in the lion's den, and all, and all those things that happen. Then a certain amount come out, and that's where the lineage of the Lord Jesus comes from. But the others are gone, they're away, they're scattered throughout the nations. I want to show you something here. 
And stay with me while I show because this is of the utmost importance. Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 34 and verse 16, he says, the Lord says, I will seek. Now remember, only the Lord can bind because the Father has smitten us. I will seek that which was lost and bring back that which was driven away. I will bind up that which was broken. God had already broken them by the Assyrian army. And then God had broken them by Ezekiel's day by the Babylonian army. Ezekiel is by the river Chebar in Babylon. And he sees the great visions and so on. And the Lord speaks to him and says, I will seek that which was lost and bring back that which was driven away. I will bind up that which was broken. Now notice, see the word lost here. It's a word avad. And it gives the idea of that which was exiled. That which was exiled. God says, I'm going to go after the exiles and I will bind their wounds. I will bring them back. It also gives the idea of a lost and a wandering sheep. It was a, if my memory serves me right, it was a, I couldn't pronounce his name because it was written in Old English, but it was a German theologian uh, who had said that this is what it means in, in the old text. It gives the idea, a picture of a lost, wandering sheep. Do you ever wonder why Jesus talks about not just the one sinner that goes astray, about I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep? Do you ever wonder why Jesus says that he goes to the lost sheep? Do you ever wonder? Because he's bringing this out from Ezekiel's prophecy. He brings it out also from Jeremiah. Turn with me, please, to the book of Jeremiah. To the book of Jeremiah. And while you're looking up uh, that book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 16. I better hurry up or I'm going to end up doing four weeks at this. See, while we're looking at it, when Ezekiel says, or the Lord says to Ezekiel, I will seek that which was lost, or the, the exile, lost, wandering sheep, and bring back. The word bring back doesn't necessarily mean, mean to a geographical location. It means I will recover them. I will turn them to face me. In other words, it means I will cause them to repent. Now, did you notice that? The idea is I will cause them to repent. And metaphorically speaking, it gives the idea of a sinner being converted. The Lord says, I'll go after them and I'll convert them to me. I'll get them to look to me again. I'll get them to be converted. So how does this happen? Jeremiah chapter 16, we'll just read a couple of verses. Verse 16. Behold, I will send for many fishers. Will you say fishers? Say it again. Let it get in your mind. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters. Will you say hunters? Hunters. Many hunters. And they shall hunt them from every mountain, from every rock, from every mountain, from every hill, out of the holes of the rocks. Pardon me. From out of the holes of the rocks. So the Lord says, I'm going to send fishers and hunters. When Jesus walks up the shores of Galilee and sees Peter and Andrew, then James and John, what is it he cries unto them? Follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Jesus just wasn't walking up there for the sake of saying, oh, you're a wee fisherman, come on, I'll make you a wee fisherman of men. And the idea is, follow me and I will make you fishers of men and ye shall catch men alive. That's the way it would read. Do you see how the Bible comes together now? Christ is saying, you follow me and I'll make you. And of course, he sends forth the apostles. Notice what he says to those, remember, the house of Israel are gone. This is now the house of Judah. The, those who have come back, they've become known as Jews. Or they, well, they have been known as Jews, but they are Judah, which we get the name Jews. John chapter 10. Let me read it to you, because I want to stay in Jeremiah. John chapter 10. Jesus says, Other sheep have I which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. They shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Say one fold. One shepherd. 
Say it again. One fold. One fold. And one shepherd. How many folds are there? How many shepherds are there? Okay. Because today, even in Pentecostalism and charismatic movement, you're finding that they're preaching there's two folds. There's a Jewish uh, post so called rapture fold where they'll get saved without the Holy Ghost, they'll get saved without the blood of Jesus, and they'll get saved by their own merit, they'll get saved by their, their, uh, their own martyrdom and whatever else by their preaching. And that's what they're teaching you today. That's only recently come into the church in the last 150 or so years. That was never in the, in the scriptures from the early church right through. That came through the Schofield Reference Bible, John Nelson Darby. That's where that came from. And its origin came from Jesuit priests. Lakuntha, you call them. And he wrote a book called, or under the name Rabbi Ben Ezra, The Coming of Christ in Power and Glory. So it was to turn the reformers' eyes off the papacy to reform it and to turn them on to a future antichrist. That's what it was written for. And the church has swallowed it up. I know I'm a fish swimming upstream. And except for some of the reformed churches out there and other Pentecostal movements, I know I'm a fish swimming upstream, but I draw a stick to the word of God. Now notice this. This is very important. Jeremiah 23. We looked at one fold and one shepherd. Jeremiah 23. And just for time's sake, again, you should mark these down and write these. It's wonderful. It talks about the shepherds who are destroying the flock. Notice this. Verse 3, just read from, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the world. What does it say? Let me hear it. Countries, will you shout it? Does it say they're just all hanging around about the same place? It says out of all the countries. God said that. I didn't say that. And yet today you're told, oh, they're all just mingled together and there's a wee group there. That is not what the Scriptures tell us. And I will gather the remnant out of my flock out of all the countries, whether I, remember he's tearing, he's smiting, the father smiting, whether I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Now this tells me something, there's going to be under shepherds, under the great shepherd. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, Christ is the great shepherd of the sheep. And we are called shepherds as pastors. So all of a sudden, the Lord's saying, I'm going to set shepherds up over you. You're not going to be in the Judaism, Tal Talmudic religion here. You're going to be different. You're going to be changed. I'm going to come and live in you, not with you. That's what he's saying here. I'm going to set shepherds up. Now notice this. And I will set shepherds up over them which shall feed my sheep, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking saith the Lord, behold, the day has come. That's an exclamation mark there for you. Behold, the day has come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David. Now, David's dead. David's buried. I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and the king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Now, notice this. In his days, that is in the righteous branch's days, in this king that's to be raised up unto David. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Who's he speaking of there? Is he speaking of Christ there? Christian brethren, is he? Christian sisters, do you believe he's speaking of Christ? Or I do with all my heart. I believe it's Christ is our righteousness. He's the Lord of righteousness. I believe that Christ and Christ alone is the one who came off the root or the branch of David, the root of Jesse, his father. I believe that he's speaking here of Christ the King who will reign and prosper and execute judgment and justice. And it's in his day, so they have to be Christian people. Does this make sense to you? I'm just reading the scripture and telling you what it means. And we're told all manner of things out there, and whoa, any wonder the church is confused and confused and upside down and transmogrified, doesn't know where it's blown up or stuffed. 
We're just reading the scriptures. Now notice this. The Lord says that he will do this, for remember, he alone can bind up that which he has smitten. So it's all and only in Christ that sin is forgiven, that the debt is paid, that the ransom has been found, that redemption has been made, reconciliation is also made in him, where the ungodly is made righteous and the outcast, the exile are brought in. God, our almighty Father, must work a work, a sovereign move, and it must be by his sovereign will, his eternal decree, his predestinating, electing love and his own divine providence. And if it's anything outside of that, it's not of God. Man-made religion, ceremonialism, the ritualism. Why do you keep going on about it? Because people are trusting in their denominations. So Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2 says, after two days will he revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Notice people who are, as it were, dead, but living. He'll raise us up and we shall live in his sight. After two days, in the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Remember the story of the prodigal son? And the elder brother stayed at home and the prodigal took his father's inheritance and went and spent it in Radis living. That's another picture of the two houses of Israel. The Jews who were those who stayed with the oracle and the kingly line in Jerusalem and then brought Christ out from the house of Judah. But the, the, the younger son, as it were, the, 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 the northern kingdom were away and they became gentilized, as it were. They were known as Gentiles or gentilized. They became like the heathen. They were worse than the heathen, actually, God said, before they were even cast out. And he's at the pig pen. Hello? He's at the pig pen. And he's wanting even to eat the pig food. That's how low he got. Hey, don't shut up me if you eat your slice of bacon. Tell me, right, okay. I don't mean you got low because you ate your bacon. I mean, that's in, in his life. <laughs> I had to clarify that. He had nothing. He lost everything. And then what happened? He came back to his father. The Lord says he would heal, he would bring back, and we shall live in his sight. And only through a sovereign move of God could we be brought back to our Father and live in his sight. So let's look at this briefly. Time is flying. I thought I'd get all this done, no problem here, and I'll have to go and write a whole lot of new stuff. I'm going to still have to write a news, lot of new stuff. So we have the Father smiting, scattered, we're gone, we're lost, we're sinful. Secondly, we have the Son uniting. I've mentioned part of that. We have the Son uniting. Only in Christ, as I said, can we be saved. Only in Christ can we be born again. Only in Christ are we forgiven. Only in Christ and in Christ alone. Now, notice the prophecy here in this book of Hosea. And I hope that this blesses you. Why would you bring this on a Sunday morning? Because one has said it's Reformation morning. But I'll tell you why I brought this on a Sunday morning as well. It's more like a Bible study. Why would I do it? Because God's people need to hear it. Need to know who you are. Need to know what the Lord has done. We need to stand out and look in at the bigger picture and see if you can see God's plan. It's more than just, well, Jesus came and died for little old me. If you see God's plan for his great kingdom upon the earth, to lift people up out of their sin, but also to raise up nations to send forth his gospel. You'll say, what a mighty God I serve. And you'll, you'll leave here. You'll leave here thinking, God, you're so big. Hosea plays again. Hosea chapter 6 again. Brothers and sisters, I, I, this is only a summary of things. I, I live in this sort of stuff. I love it. It's only a, it's by far, by no means, I should say, is it exhaustive. There's so much in this. I could teach this for months. And this stuff is just mighty. This is just a summary. So if we look at our reading, come now, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, he will heal, he hath smitten, he will bind us up. After two days 
will he revive us. And the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Okay, will you say two days? I'm getting you to say it because I want you to get it into you. Two days. Now, in Scripture, if we look at two literal days here where the prophet has spoken, things have passed many thousands of years ago and nothing's happened. It's a prophetic utterance. So what does two days mean? A day can mean a year. Of prophetic terms, a day can be for a year or a day can be for a thousand years. Okay? So when we're looking at this, this is simple if you grab it. If you can grasp this now, it's as simple. So he says, after two days will he revive us. Okay? So a day for a thousand years, because after even two years, literal years, nothing happened. So it's a, we have to look then, what prophetic utterance is this? It's a day for a thousand years. Two days is 2,000 years. Now, whenever we go, for example, to Matthew's Gospel 20, write it down and you can read it when you go home. Remember the Lord tells the parable of the man being hired to work in the vineyard. Israel is the vineyard of the Lord, the Old Testament tells us. So there's all meanings in this. It's not just picking grapes, you know. It's all about working in his vineyard. And whenever the Lord talks about this, he pays the men how much per day? One penny per day. One penny per day. So then when we go to the parable of the Good Samaritan, we all know it, where he pours in the oil and the wine to the man that was beaten and puts him on his beast and brings him to the innkeeper, as it were, and he says to the innkeeper to look after this man. It says in... <clears throat> Luke chapter 10, verse 35, the Good Samaritan being a picture of the Lord, he says, whatsoever thou spendest more, notice, more, whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again. Not if, when I come again, I will repay thee. Christ is saying, I'm coming back. And he gives them two pence. Now, if a pen, one penny is a day, two pennies is two days, when we put it for a day, as there's a thousand years, that's for 2,000 years. And notice what he says. Speaking, this is to do with his second coming again. He says, whatsoever thou spendest more, if I go over 2,000 years, if I go over it, do you know what you're getting here? You're getting the four square gospel of one message. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is healer. Jesus is a baptizer in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the soon coming King. He says, whatever I, give, or whatever I owe you, he says, when I come again, I will repay you. So two days is 2,000 years. Peter tells us that in 2 Peter 3 and 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years as one day. So now that we know what two days are, let's read Hosea 6 and verse 2. After two days. <laughs> After 2,000 years. Notice that. After 2,000 years. After two days. He will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now, how do we work out the reformation from this? And I must try and get this in as quick as I can for we'll do more next week. If we take Israel, ancient Israel, as God's prophetic time clock, and we take the deportation of the northern kingdom of the house of Israel, different years, uh, Assyrians were back and forward carrying them away. 744 BC was really their main deportion, their deportations. The fall of their capital city, Samaria, where their lines of kings come out like Ahab and so on. It fell to the Assyrians in 721 BC. And the final deportations were around 676 BC. So if we take it from the last deportation of the house of Israel, 676 BC, and the Lord comes in between this time and he dies at Calvary and he's risen from the dead and he ascends into glory and the, the apostles are now going forth in the power of the gospel and Paul is prohibited to go east, must go west to preach the gospel. Notice this. Final deportation of 676, and we take 2,000 years off, 
that brings us right down, 676, you go right down, right down to the year naught, one for the carrying over, because there is no year naught, for minus 1 BC to 1 BC, and then continue on taking off the 2,000 years, it brings us to the year 1324 AD. 1324 AD. What happened? It was at this period of time around this area where John Wycliffe was born, who is known as the morning star of the Reformation. Ah. That's exact, isn't it? He was born, and he became not only known as the morning star of the Reformation, but he preached against the teachings of purgatory, indulgences, and the doctrine of transubstantiation. He started to show the light of God's Word before the Reformation. Johann Huss took John Wycliffe's writings and said, before me and Allison have been in his house, and his church is now just, well, it's like a, some sort of center thing. And his pulpit's there, and we've stood in his bedroom, and I would go and look at all those things. Well, jo Johann Huss, or John Huss, he was the one who was taken and burnt, strangled and burnt at the stake for being in heck. And whenever they were burning him, he then uttered a prophecy. Did you know that? Prophetic utterance from a, from a reformer? Absolutely, yes, they did, actually, believe it or not. Many of them actually did prophesy. And Johann Huss, John Huss, he prophesied. His name means goose. And he prophesied that coming would be a great eagle that no man would be able to lay hold of and, and, and to close up. And 100 years later, Martin Luther came. And his name means eagle or swan. That's why you see a swan and a goose in some of the old Renaissance paintings representing us. That was their secret ways because of the things that were happening. Give me another five minutes. I know we're time's finished. We're running late. If you lived around the time of John Wycliffe, you'd have witnessed the Black Plague going across Britain and Europe. You would have witnessed the Black Plague. You know the Ring a Ring a Rosie song we all sang? To do with the Black Plague. That's where it comes from. A tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. I tell you something, see the amount that aren't here this morning because they said they've got colds and coughs and flus and they've got whatever infections, whatever. And you think the Black Plague was hitting Donald Clone Island at the minute? The Black Plague came across Europe and parts of it, one third of the population. Notice where it was, Europe and Britain. Why? Because God was starting to heal. God was starting to bind up. God was bringing forth the word. God was getting it published and printed. God was starting to raise up men as he did in Israel of old, like prophets in the land to start to preach the true word of God. And so what happens? The Black Plague comes. The French and the English start fighting the Hundred Years' War, trying to destroy one another. And the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, superstition and the abuses, the idolatry and the darkness and greed of the church for all the things of purgatory to get their money in was increasing greatly. And God set fire to a little glimmer of hope, the morning star. You know what brightness it shines across the land and the horizon when the sun first comes up and it beams across the earth? That's the morning star. And John Wycliffe, he comes and he sees the truth of God's word. Johann Huss, he then comes and reads his word. And then after that, men started to see the gospel. Men started to see that the just shall live by faith, exactly as Hosea, the prophet, had prophesied it. Is that not marvelous? Is that not mighty? John Wycliffe trained what was known as the poor preachers and sent them out to preach all around Britain, called the Lollards. Translated the scriptures to give us a Bible in our own English language and also in our own hands. Listen to the words of John Wycliffe. Listen to this. God's word will give men new life more than other words that are for pleasure. O oh, marvelous power of the divine seed which overpowers strong men in arms, softens hard hearts, and renews and changes into divine men those who had been brutalized by sins and departed infinitely far from God. Obviously, such miraculous power could never be worked by the work of a priest if the spirit of life and the eternal word did not above all things else, work with it. The words of John Wycliffe. He says, it doesn't matter 
who it is, if the Holy Ghost doesn't take his word, you're never going to be changed. Now, brothers and sisters, listen, I've said it at the beginning, I'm saying it again. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or what denomination you say you're affiliated to, you must be born again. It's as simple as that. You must be born again. So the two days was when John Wycliffe came and he died on the 31st of December, 1384. Listen, he was hated that much 30 years later. 30 years at the Council of Constance ordered all his works to be found and to be burned to dig up his bones that were lying in the grave over 30 years by now, to burn them, crush them to the ashes, and to pour them into the river swift. And they did that. Bishop Fuller says this about that happening, crushing, burning of the bones. They burnt his bones to ashes and cast them into the swift. A neighboring brook running hard by, thus the brook had conveyed his ashes to Avon, from Avon to the Severn, from Severn into the narrow seas, and they into the main ocean, and thus the ashes of John Wycliffe are the emblem of his doctrine, which is now dispersed the whole world over. In other words, when they done that, it was like the ashes went, it was like almost parabolic of the word of God that would grow from the man who first translated the morning star, bursting of the Reformation, burning, bursting across. Great awakenings happened. In the third day, he will raise us up. He will, we shall live in his sight. After 2,000 years into the third day, the great awakening happened on the 31st of October, 1517. Martin Luther, he nailed his 95 theses to the Wittenberg Cathedral door in Germany. Listen, Holdrich Swingley was raised up in Switzerland. John Calvin later raised up in France. John Knox was raised up in Scotland. Thomas Cromner Archbishop of Canterbury was raised up. They preached sola scriptura by scripture alone, sola fide by faith alone, solus Christos through Christ alone, sola gratia by grace alone, solo deo gratia, deo gloria, glory to God alone. Queen Elizabeth I and the expansion of the people of the British Empire went forth as God has said, to reach all the lands of the earth. And the Bible went printed and was put into every nation. God says he would do the healing. He says that he will raise us up on the third day. And God has kept his own word. Brothers and sisters, does that not amaze you? Does that not amaze you that a way in an Old Testament prophecy... God says he'll do it. Do you know, also speaks of the Holy Spirit, which I haven't time to do. I'll do it next week. The Holy Spirit, it says, he will pour rain as the latter rain upon us. The Father smites, the Son unites, and the Holy Spirit ignites. And God bless his word to us. I know it was long, but I needed to get that point because next week we're in Revelation. I'm going to show you all of this matching revelation to bring it on through in another prophecy. God bless us this morning.